Real radio. Real radio. Plant seed and water seed. Welcome to Real Talk Radio, the show that says just because you do not attend with them doesn't mean that you're not in here. The hymn being Jesus, the show that plants seeds and water seeds, but God gives the increase. Let's talk about it on Real Talk Radio. This show is a continuation of the Church Hope Revolution. Enjoy the show. Welcome, 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 one and all, to another episode of Real Talk Radio. Uh, I am Nathan, a.k.a. Second Twin, um, and today on Real Talk Radio, we are going to be talking about spiritually divided families. Now, not necessarily families, but basically relationships that you may have. Um, It could be between a spouse. um, It could be friends. It could be... uh, Parents and children, uh, cousins, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, all those different types of relationships that are affected when one person leaves and another person stays uh, within the church system. Now, uh, I think everybody has some type of experience. I, I can't say that. A lot of people have this type of experience um, where they don't know how to deal with it when it first happens. Um and it could be very, very heartening. Um, this should be near and dear to a lot of people. And hopefully, um, you know, we'll get some callers to call in and share some of their stories later on in the show that will be able to help some people who are in the midst of this transition, um, people who have just started it and don't know how to quite navigate these treacherous waters, or as Scripture calls it, the wilderness, because this can be a wilderness experience. Um, today is February 14th, 2016, and I'm going to pass the mic to my brethren, John. What it do? Yeah, man. Um, yeah, for me, I like what you said, that this could be disheartening for folks, uh, and it really can. Um, I remember when I first came out, and not just necessarily the familial relationships, but even your relationships with your past church members, because I remember not wanting to post certain things, thinking, like, how, what are they going to think about this? What are they going to think about me? And at that time, I wasn't strong enough or, you know, strong enough to defend my beliefs. I knew what I, what I knew, but I couldn't really defend it. But I still had to do what I had to do. And like I said, not just with my family, but also with my uh, church friends and stuff like that, too, so... It goes it goes pretty deep. Brother Rob. Yeah, man. You talk about spiritual spiritually divided families, man. Um that uh church friends, you know, that, that separation is real, man. You know, once you're coming into the truth about a lot of the, you know, empty uh religious tradition in the institutional church, man, you start, you know, uh talking about it and you start being open about your your views, man, that, that that definitely causes separation, man, and, um, you know, some isolation. Sometimes you could be, you know, looked at as an outcast, man, and we see it, uh, we see this example played out, you know, in so many ways, man. Um, you know, we see it in, in, uh, marriages, you know, uh, nuclear families, man. Uh, it's just, it's a, a definite, uh, plague in the body man that spiritual division man and um hopefully you know something is said today that will help somebody to to navigate through those treacherous waters man mm-hmm. uh l l oh <clears throat> morning brothers um this is one of those topics um and situations where you're it's like uh, you're almost taken away from multiple families so, for example, if somebody grew up in the church and that's all they knew, parents were there, their grandparents were there, that becomes like a family. You're shunned by them once you start to learn or you delve out on your own from learning. You're shunned by your own family at the same time, and then you're shunned by the congregation. So there's like a trifold effect of that that kills off that uh, that, that bonding, and that's the part that 
hurts the other person, uh, whether they're in that family by marriage, in that family by blood, or in that family by relationship with the congregation. It's a kind of a sickening uh, thing to do to people, but we'll get into that. Mm-hmm. Dr. Dre. Hey, what's going on, y'all? Um, this is uh, one of those topics that pretty much hits uh, hits home for me, you know. Um, but one of the things that um, I think we're going to dive into, I know we're going to go into, you know, the whole, you know, splitting of marriages, splitting of families, of splitting of friends and whatnot. Um, if you were the type of person like I was whose marriage started in the church. Um, I met my wife when I was in church. And, um, you know, when you, um, when you decide, you know, that you are going to leave the institutionalized church system while your wife, who you met in the church, uh, begin, you know, remains in the church, um, that sets off a whole different dynamic of it all because, you know, again, you know, um, it's all, yes, it's all you know, but now you have, especially if you are a person in leadership, we were both in leadership, um, this dynamic where, you know, your pastor wants you back and now will use your spouse against you to try to get you back in or use your family member to try to get you back in. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's it's a really treacherous dealing. Um, we're definitely going to dive into that one. All right. Dre, can you pray us in, bro? Father God, we thank you this morning for all that you've done for us, all that you will continue to do. Father, we thank you because we know that, you know, you're not the author of confusion and you're not, you're definitely not the author of division. And we pray right now that, anyone that's listening to this broadcast will be able to seek you and be able to know that you are the comfort. If they've decided to leave and their spouse or their family members decided to stay and there's a division there, we want them to know that you are their ultimate comfort. Yes, you have set people in the body of Christ to help them along and, and, to, and to guide them on their way. But ultimately, it's all about you, Jesus. And we want, we want to thank you and we, 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 we praise you right now for all that you in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And, and, and we know, and, and let me speak, say this too, I think it's, uh, and I'm speaking from a spousal aspect. I think it's more difficult when the wife leaves and the husband stays than, you know, vice versa. And I say that because, you know, in the church, we are taught to follow the man, uh, that the man is the head of the household, that the man leads in the woman or the wife follows the husband. Um, so you have a lot of people who people grew up in different churches or whatnot, they generally go to where the husband decides to go, um, generally speaking. And this ain't for everybody, so don't try to just say, no, nah, not me. This, if it ain't you, it ain't you. But generally speaking, the woman usually goes wherever the husband decides to go to church or she'll join his church or whatnot. Um, so when a man leaves and a woman stays, it's a, a little easier on the man in one aspect than it is on a woman because the woman is taught to follow her husband. So she decides to leave, then there's pressure on her to want to be with her husband because, you know, women want to be with their man, you know, especially if he's a good guy, you want to follow your husband. But some things, you know, when God is speaking to you and you know it's God and he's called you out and there's not a question in your mind um, for you to leave, and your husband's still in there. I know that can be difficult. And I just want to encourage any woman in that situation, uh, no matter where you are. I don't care if it's mm-hmm. been a week, a month, a year, ten years. If you know, if you're out and he's still in, I'm pretty sure you've matured to the level where it doesn't bother you as much. But there's still that pressure there. And also, there's pressure on the member that's still in the system as well. He's getting questions about you, or she's getting questions 
about mm-hmm. uh, uh, about you. So the spouse that still goes is getting pressure from the church, uh, possibly. Um, and so now they're forced to either lie uh, about why why the spouse is not coming, or to make excuses, or to even bash their uh, their mate. Um, mm-hmm. And 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 I, you know, can even say that you know I heard spouses bash their mate. Uh, not like put them down, but say that they ain't spiritually ready. They so immature, and you know they they, they just want to do whatever they want to do. The devil got a hold of them, and they have to do that in order to save face with mm-hmm. uh, the people, their church family, and that can be extremely difficult. And that creates more anger and resentment towards the spouse that has left. And now that's more uh, 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 arguing that's going to go on because. She or he ain't going back, but the person that still wants to come back. And then they may even have the pastor trying to uh, uh, get them back. So they're trying to pull you back into a system. Uh, um, John, go ahead. I was going to uh, jump on what you were just talking about a little bit. When you have the spouse that's still in the church, that pressure that's upon them, you know, they'll, like you said, they'll be forced to say different things. They'll be forced to uh, lie sometimes because they they may be fighting a lot with their spouse and then they they, they go to church and say, oh everything's okay you know they're they're fine or whatnot and knowing that they're not but then the part where they have to they feel bad because they feel like as a man like say the man still in he feel like well I'm not strong enough to leave my wife in in the things of God which is not true but he feels that extra pressure, like you said, he has to lie, and sometimes he has to come up with excuses for that spouse or why they're not there. And then he'll say, y'all y'all pray for sister so-and-so, y'all pray for my wife, y'all pray for me, you know, we, we battling the devil, the devil's battling. And anything happening, you know, every time they'll say, well, how's uh, sister so-and-so, How, how's your wife? It's troubling to, to that spouse that's still in there when they got to deal with that. It's very troubling to them. And like you said, when they go home, they have that on them, and they go home and they start fighting. And they may not know that they're starting to fight because of that, that tension that, that built up in them, but then they look at their spouse sideways, you know, you ain't even doing what you're supposed to be doing. You ain't get, you know, you out of the will of God, this, that, and the other. They don't even want to talk to you. If you're out and you know what's going on, they don't even want to talk to you anymore. They don't, they don't want to talk to you about church stuff because – you know where you stand, and you are willing to stand on the truth, but they don't see your truth. They don't see it. So it, it does cause a conflict. And uh, I think that's because of the system. Oh, oh go ahead, Leo. Go ahead. Uh, I, was say, I think that's because of the system itself. You know, like, nothing breaks MCD faster than actually just leaving the church. So if one spouse is still in there, be it the wife, and in this case the husband, <clears throat> He may get questions like, how is your wife? How is the sister? He may get questions like, are you okay? Because you're the man you're supposed to lead. But at the end of it all, since they excommunicated her because she's not going to come back, they're putting it on his mind that she's not greater even for you as a as a husband. And, that can, and she's not hearing that, but his actions are showing that when he comes home, that can belittle her, of course, uh, as John and Nick were just saying. That is the key ingredient in the system, though, once you're excommunicated, everything that go towards you, old uh, church mates, your your spouse, your kids even, if they still go to church because the husband is in church, can still look at you sideways as well. That's how that system works. So for women, it's, it's equally as hard because they feel not only have they lost their spouse to the church, they may lose their children and they may start to lose a bit of themselves because it's easier on love for the woman than it is the man. Again, like uh, John was saying, when the man is out, it's easier because he, he there's a breakthrough that happened with the man and he can trickle it down to his wife. But when a wife is out and she has to uphold the family uh, in a way that he's not, it, it may you know wear down on her in a little bit. But equally for women, it's the mindset of men. You got to understand, like we have that privilege of being a man that uh, women don't have, of course. So our ego plays into us when when we feel like we can't lead you, like we've done some damage uh-huh. to this. Uh, person because of this system, 
he's either going to see his downfall in doing that and see the MC for what it is in the church system and leave with you, because at this point, the woman has to be the, the person that takes the man out, like wholeheartedly. Her actions, her way of being, her love, her support for her man still has to stay steadfast, but now on a deeper level, spiritually, you've got to become the person that's going to wake your husband up, and I think that's the hardest draw for most women because it feels like she's leaving at that point, and that's normally what men are supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And then let me jump in real quick because I want the other brothers to jump in, but you said something so important. Uh, our pride and ego is, is 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 a killer, man. That hurts us so much because now you're at the point where I'm supposed to be the head of the household. I'm supposed to be the man. I'm supposed to be leading my family, but I can't, excuse this language, but make, quote, unquote, my wife come back to church. She's not following me. So that Mm -hmm. does something to us internally. Um, Like you said, we have this male privilege, uh, and people may not want to admit it, but it's like this male supremacy. Mm It's male supremacy. Mm -hmm. We live in a male-dominated society. Um, But we have this male privilege, and our egos are fragile. Our egos are very fragile. And now we feel like she's not listening to me. She's not obeying me. And and I'm going to speak on that a little bit later, how that affected me, even though I was the one who was out. But it led to a big argument with me and my spouse. But that argument led to a breakthrough in me to help me see some things. But I think our egos um, hurt us a lot because now we feel like the woman, uh, our wife, our wife, my wife, my woman, the mother of my children is not following me anymore. She's listening to all you these know, other people on the radio and YouTube and Facebook, and she's not following me. Go ahead, Rob. You know what's funny about that, man? That ego is it, it, so misplaced because you know who's at the other end of that ego? It's another man. It's the pastor. <laughs> So Uh-oh. why is it that 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 a, a man would have you know his ego be hurt because he can't quote unquote make his wife come to church, but nine times out of ten it's the pastor putting pressure on him. What's up? Well, what, 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 what's up with your wife? You know what I mean? He might not say it directly, but he might be preaching about it, um, and, and sometimes he might be saying it directly to to the person, depending on how deep they are in the ministry or how close they are to the pastor. The pastor might be one of those pastors that's preaching all these you know series on. Uh, relationships and and marriage and, you know, how uh, the man is supposed to be the head and everything like that, which is, which is true. But we all know that some pastors put their own spin on it and it, and it becomes like an oppressive thing. So uh, a lot of times, man, it's another, it's another man at the other end of that spectrum. So, so he can have all the, the hurt, pride and ego and everything when it comes to his wife, but he's letting another man control his thoughts and his outlook on that thing. Mm Mm-hmm. And didn't that happen to you, Jonathan? When you your your former pastor told you that you was weak? Yeah, that's that's after I said I was going to leave. But since you brought it up, I guess I'll go ahead and tell you. This was at uh, my last church. Uh, where I was the elder there, there was only uh, me, another elder, and then a pastor. We were like the top three, you know, leadership. You know, it was the pastor. He was the apostle. Well, I guess he said he claimed to have all five gifts. So he was the apostle, and then me and two elders were like, I guess, his under shepherds, I guess, specifically. But my wife had decided to leave that church, not the system, but just leave that church. And he called me in his office at first and was telling me some stuff, like putting further separation well, since your wife has left, then I'm going to remove my covering from her. I'll still cover you and your boys, but I'm no longer going to cover your wife because she decided to leave. And in my head, I'm like, I'm her covering. But I didn't uh, have enough gumption to say that to him. you know. And I'm just being honest. I, I didn't feel it was my place to say that to him. Um, but in my heart and my mind, I'm like, I'm her covering, not you, a spiritual covering or whatever. And when I finally decided to leave, maybe about a month later, uh, he was telling me I ain't no real man because I can't make my wife come to church. I ain't no elder um, because the elder knows how to rule his house well. Um, And anything I try to do in ministry would fail 
unless I came back to apologize to him first and then to the congregation for leaving. But, you know, he tried to call my manhood at the question. He tried to call my eldership, even though I was an elder before I got to his church. Uh, in my mind, I was an elder before I got there. So he tried to call, that, call all of that into question because I couldn't make my wife kind of church. And the way he treated his wife, I think he uh, 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 abused her, not physically, but, uh, you know, mental abuse. The way he talked to her, just the way she would kowtow. Uh, it was like, because you got your wife in check um, like that. Don't mean I, I'm not trying to dominate and rule my wife like that. You know, that's kind of relationship. Y'all got more power to you, but that ain't me. But, yeah, he called my manhood into question. I ain't no real man because I can't make my wife come make the church and all this. He even removed his cover from her and whatnot. But, yeah, it was sad. It was but sad. But you know what I find interesting, though, about your story, Jonathan, is the fact that he felt this way all along, but he didn't bring it up until you decided to leave. Right, right. Think about that. Right. Mm-hmm. Dre? <laughs> Yeah, um, one of the things that I was thinking about while we were talking about all of this, cause, you know, right now, you know, the the topic is mainly about how, you know, um, how it is if a woman leaves and the man stays behind. Um, you know, my situation was that I left and my wife stayed behind. And I think in her mind, one of the things that, you know, she was thinking to herself was, you know, if 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 my husband isn't in church, then you know he's not my head. So who's going to be my head? Mm-mm. Okay. And what ended up happening was that um, all of her instructions started coming from our pastor, my mm-hmm. former pastor. You know what I'm saying? Um, inevitably, what ended up happening was that my pastor became her head even though we were still married. And so now, you know, she, she's, um, my pastor was giving my wife instructions on what to do and how to act and, you know, all of these different things. And basically, um, you know, becoming the head of my house. And I'm like, no, that's, that's, that's not going to happen. You know what I'm saying? We're not going to allow outside influences in our marriage anymore, okay? And I stress that anymore aspect because it used to happen, okay? And, you know, you know, people, people, if you're honest with yourself, men, if you're honest with yourselves, you know, yes, you used to do that. You know what I'm saying? Pastor said this, the pastor said the Holy Spirit said this, and so we're going to do, you know, that's how we were. You understand what I'm saying? And so, you know, when I got, I came out of the church, and basically it wasn't even so much that I was out of the institutionalized church system. I just left that church. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, you know, with with me being, you know, gone out of the church picture, um, you know, my wife was receiving um, instructions from our pastor on, you know, This is what you should do. Tell him this. Tell him that. You know, there was a situation that came up after I left that, um, you know, you know, well, tell him that if he don't come back, blah blah blah. You know, and it 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 really got to a point where you know my words to my wife meant absolutely nothing. It was all about what the pastor was saying when. In retrospect, that's what it was all along. I just couldn't see that. You understand what I'm saying? And so, you know, we need to be mindful, you know, whether it's whether it's the husband or the wife that's left, the opposite spouse who's still in the church may be receiving um, instructions from either the pastor, one of the elders, the deacons, you know, let's not forget our girlfriends who were in the church too. You know, you, you, you know, you know, when the sisterhood get together, sometimes, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying. But um, 
you know, what you, we need to see where, you know, all of these things are coming from. So these, these new things, now that you've left, we need to look at these new things that are happening now, you know, and see where they're coming from and see how it's affecting people and point these things out. You know, baby, you didn't use it, you, you, you didn't do that before. Why are you doing that now? You know what I'm saying? And, you know, it may cause an argument, but it may also call, spark a conversation where, you know, you can, you, you, you can actually point some things out, show some things, whether he or her, you know, and, you know, be like, well, you know, bam, this is happening because such and such told you to do this. You know, it's just something to think about. And let me share this story. This is a, a little story about one of the other uh, brothers, Kevin Oliver, and I'm sure he don't mind us sharing his story. He's told it multiple times um, about him and his uh, his ex-wife and how the church and the church leadership, like if, if one spouse leaves or something like that, or even questions the pastor, um, how they are the spouse that's on the church's side is so involved or so, I won't say brainwashed, but so, you know, so churchified, rather, that they'll go to great lengths. The church will go to great lengths to separate that person. Now, Kevin asked the pastor one question. The pastor was getting a big salary, and he asked for, he asked a question about why are we uh, giving this extra money to you to buy this house or something like that. It has something to do with some money. He just asked a simple question, and they jumped down his throat. The whole church jumped down his throat, and that one simple question led to a series of unfortunate events, uh, ultimately leading to his divorce. And the church was actually paying for the lawyer. They were taking him to court. They were lying on Kevin, doing this, that, and the other. But the church was, uh, you know, they were using his wife, you know, Kevin's talking about stuff to his wife, thinking, you know, stuff you say in your marriage bed, you're talking to your wife, you think your wife got your back, but she's running back to the church, telling the church, uh, telling the pastor everything Kevin's saying. So, like, she was actually spying on her husband for the church, and that's sad. And that's how deep that this stuff can be sometimes. And the church is not supposed to be, in people's marriage. And I think we did a show a while ago called When the Church Plays Matchmaker, and we talked about this a little bit, how the church is always involved in somebody's marriage. Get mm-hmm. out of marriages, pastors. Stay out of people's marriage. Stay out of it. Stay out of their bed. But they're exactly. always in the middle of it. Always. Stay out, Play one stay out of their bed. Go ahead. Hold on. Stay out of their bed literally. <laughs> 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 Literally, <laughs> literally and figuratively, I mean, yeah, they are, they're always preaching. About, I mean, you got these real super spooky, deep religious pastors that want to actually try to manage how couples are dealing with each other in, in the marriage bed. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I've heard it all, man. I've heard these guys say certain positions are sinful and certain oh, uh, yeah. Certain certain things you do in the bed with your with your with your spouse with your spouse now with your spouse, <laughs> you know what I mean? Are of the devil and all this type man. Sh- get out of people's bed. Shut up. You know what I'm saying? Get out of marriage hey, you know, business, man. Real, real talk. <laughs> and you know the sad and the sad thing about it is that most of these pastors that are doing these things can hardly hold on to a marriage themselves. Mm-hmm. But they're giving marriage advice to people who really need marriage advice and want to stay in their marriage, you know, but they can't hold on to their own man or their own woman. It's sad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, remember remember Juanita, Juanita and Bishop Weeks uh, did their little love and marriage in the spirit or something like that they did. It was whole conferences all over the country. Uh, people was paying all this money to go to these different conferences. And didn't they get divorced? Like a few months later? Like, mm. You holding all this stuff. Keep people out your marriage. So you know you can blame some of it on the pastors, but then a lot of it you have to blame on the couples themselves. And it just could be just a lack of knowledge uh, because they don't want to pay money for a marriage, a real marriage counselor. So they just will go to their pastor, and then the pastor's all up in your business now. 
Mm-hmm. That's why I keep the pastor out your marriage bed. Now, if you want just seeking advice or something like that on how uh, from an older person who you think has been married, that's that's cool. But they don't have to know every single thing that's going on in your marriage. They really don't. They really mm-hmm. don't. Trust and believe they're talking about what your business to somebody. Yes. Mm-hmm. In the yeah. church. When you got to trust and believe. Trust and believe. Hey. Please trust it. He's talking, talking to his to wife your... about it in, in their marriage bed. He's talking exactly. to it, and he's now talking to her girlfriends about it. Your business is getting spread. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows. But you. Yeah, folks have to uh, yeah, really yeah. understand that churches are nothing but just big gossip centers, man. It's like huge high schools all over again. Yeah. Well. There you go. Yeah. Man, oh, man, oh, man. So, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, and, and I speak up from my experience, my wife goes to the church today. She, she's still in the up church. Bad, now. Uh-oh. Emma, how's this? Is this better? All right. Now, you, now you're good. You're good now. Okay. Okay. Um, my wife still goes to church. Matter of mm-hmm. fact, she's getting ready to go right now. Upstairs getting dressed, getting ready to go. Um, and as I was stating, that ego thing, it got to me one day. Um because I, you know, I'm the man. So I had, we had to sit down. I remember we were standing in the kitchen, and we had this little conversation. And I was like, I'm tired of you going to church. So I think what happened, I was going through our bank account, you know, online, and I saw she had wrote a check to this church, and it was it was like thirteen dollars. So it was just like an offering, because um, she wasn't one to pay her tithes. Like even when both was in, I was the tither. She wasn't no tither. She's just like, no, nah, we ain't giving all that money. But so she wrote a little thirteen dollars check. So I was like, that's that's it. So we had a conversation. Break Breaking up again? Go ahead. Right now. Okay. So I told her, uh uh, you know, I'm the head of this house. I'm the man and you're supposed to be following me. You 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 said you read the Bible, you know, where the woman's supposed to follow the man and submit to the man and all that. And I was just going. It. Anyway, I said all that, and I told her, "You're not going to church anymore. I'm putting my foot down, and I'm not allowing you to go to church." And that just led to a big fight, argument. You can't tell me what to do. You ain't my daddy. All this kind of stuff. And you know, I had to apologize to her. Because I'm not her daddy. I'm not her Holy Ghost. I'm not her God. And it's not my place to um, dominate her, dominate her spiritual walk, dominate her, her, her other thing. Nobody, no leader in the Bible did that. None, none of the apostles uh, dominated anybody. Matter of fact, Paul even said that. Uh, not that we have, uh, uh, I can't even think of it right now. But dominion you know, over your faith, but we are fellow yeah, workers right. with you. We don't I'm have like, dominion. And so I was trying to put my dominion over her as the head of the household. But, you know, I got checked. She checked me and God checked me. Like, that's my daughter. And I had to realize, and that, that from that moment there, gave me a new perspective on how I deal with other people who were still in the church. Because it opened my eyes that, that I can't change nobody. I can't fix anybody. I can't make people see what God has shown me. And from that day forward, I treated other people like uh, that were still in with more compassion because of that big fight I had with my wife. And I had to learn to treat my wife with compassion. It's not my place to tell you you can't go to church. I can tell you the reasons why I don't go, why I don't think you should go, but I cannot make you. I can't make any grown person do anything unless I you know, want to physically hold her here and chain her down, you know, tie her to the bed, you know, get my misery on and break her ankles. I, you know, I can't make anybody. <laughs> yeah, uh, somebody catch that later on broadcast. Y'all know misery. But anyway, <laughs> you know, you can't make people see things. And the opposite, she can't make me come back to church. Men, if you are still in the church, if perhaps you are listening to this and you are still going to church and your wife is not, you cannot force her to do anything. You are not her Holy Spirit. You are not her daddy. Um, You ain't none of that. You are the head of the household, true, but that don't mean that you can make your wife do anything. It doesn't Um, mean that you're a dictator. It doesn't mean you're a bully. It doesn't mean that, you know. 
you know, and it don't make drag her. It don't make you weak. Think. Right, right. Because we are co, I, I we think, are equal in this relationship. I mean, it, it, it's it's a it's a partnership. It's a, you, we just have different roles within a relationship, but it's still a partnership. And we have to get to that place where we understand that. That I, just because I'm the head, that don't mean that I'm better than my wife. No. So, so Jonathan, question: How did your wife feel when you left church, or, or how did she feel? And how does she feel now? Like when you first left, how did she feel? And how does she feel now? Um, see, we gotta understand. I, I think I was a little blessed because my wife never was like into church like that. So she wasn't like one to go in and be all and going on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, every you know, Sunday and every, she wasn't like that. She's still like that. Um, she's been to I think about five or six different churches here lately that she visits and she hasn't joined the church since 2010 when we both left that last church. She has not joined any other church, but she's uh, been going back and forth to different churches. Um, so how she felt, she wanted me to come back to church because she believed that, you know, we should go to church, not that it was a necessity, not that we was going to go to hell if we didn't, but that it was helpful, you know, uh, and she feels the same way today, but she understands on uh, why I feel the way I feel. She just doesn't agree with it because she mm. she likes church. She she likes the fellowship. She likes the singing. She likes that's what she liked. That's what she liked. Um, a lot of times we don't really have a lot of spiritual conversations. We will every now and then, but we don't because they will lead to an argument. You know, and uh, so that's for me. I choose not to engage because I know that she's not really ready to receive a lot of stuff that I have to say. Now, I drop seeds here and there. I water some seeds. Uh, or plant some seeds and water some seeds, but I'm going to let God show her the way he showed me. So she ain't mad at me. I ain't mad at her. Um, that, that's where we at, but that's our relationship. So a lot of it really is going to depend on what type of relationship you guys have too, how strong your relationship yeah. was, you know? Yeah, because with, because with my with my relationship, um, after I left that church, um, and I left that church either on a Tuesday or on a, or, or on a Wednesday. By that weekend, we were broken up. Dang. Mm. Okay, <laughs> and it was it was it was it was mainly because um, Pastor was pressuring her to get me back in. I wasn't trying to go back in, and um, you know a lot of fights broke out that week. You know what I'm saying, and. Um, it, it it was just crazy, you know. Basically, you know, and, and anyone from my old church, even till this day, um, you know, they start off their conversations the same. Well, pastor said this, apostle says this, you know. what I'm saying, and that's how my wife was, you know. What I'm saying every, you know, every time um, there was a word from the Lord, and you know, I had a problem with my wife doing something, you know, she, you know, pastor would say you know, why are you upset that your wife is obeying the Lord? You know what I'm saying? Mm. And so so basically, yeah, basically what it was was that, you know, what she said was what the Lord said. Anytime she spoke, the Lord was speaking. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? And, you know, trust me, I found out later that that definitely was not the case. But um, it was the influence that, my pastor had over my wife and the fact that I just wasn't going, I was, like I said before, I just left that church. It wasn't that I wasn't going back to any church. I just wasn't going back to that one. And because I, you know, I was in leadership and I wore many hats in that church. Um, that was the reason why they wanted me back. And when they couldn't get me back, the pressure was, was on on very high on my wife, you know what I'm saying, and it led to my wife actually accusing me of hitting her when I know I didn't, you know what I'm mm. saying, and I ended up you know I ended up going to jail behind that, um, and Pastor is with her the whole step of the way, mm -hmm. you understand what I'm saying, and so um, 
I don't get that. Yeah. Like the mentality. Like, do you really? Did they really think that lying on you like that would really force you to come back? And if you did come yes. back, that you would be happy about it and everything go yes. back to normal? Did they really think that? Yes. I I, I I'll tell you what happened. Um, it was on a weekend, so you know where I was. Um, I'm in the cell. The judge was actually in. Um, you know, was. In the cell, not in the cell with me physically, but, you know, you know, the judge came, you know, to arraign me, basically, right? And they're going over the charges. Now, um, if you remember, they, uh, I said earlier that my pastor said um, something that, you, you, you know, said something against me in, you know, in the church. He said that I stole some money, okay? Um, the funny thing is that it only amounted to $20. In any case, um what happened was they, you know, the judge was speaking to my lawyer. Um, no, no, not my lawyer. It was the prosecutor. They were, they, um, they were, they were both speaking together, and they were looking at the charges, and they looked at, you know, my charge, which, which was a domestic abuse charge, and they were looking at, um, because I didn't even know that my pastor had gone down and took out a charge about this money. You see what I'm saying? And basically, they're like, you know, well, we're not even going to touch that one because that's, you know, that looks like nothing. This is a charge right here, talking about the domestic domestic dispute. You know, they wasn't looking at the charge that my pastor tried to bring against me. Okay? So, yeah, they thought that, you know, if I wasn't coming back to church, then they were going to go to the authorities about this so-called money that I stole from the church and the instrument that they used in order to implement all of this was my wife. Oh, Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) We got the general. Your pastor must have been my pastor's protege. (laughs) (laughs) Right now. I lived it, brother. <laughs> Woo! Boy. Yeah, man. I trust that your story brother. a little bit, man, but I can't tell it like you can tell it. Brother, <laughs> this is why I'm singing Negro spirituals this morning. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, good morning. It's been a while since I've talked to y'all, brother. So, good morning. What's going on, man? What's up, homie? What's up, man? What's up, what's up? I'm sorry. Who is the brother who was just telling the story? Andre. Andre. Andre? Andre? Yeah, brother, brother. <laughs> I mean, see, see, the people who are who are listening to this, right? Uh, first of all, who's that, uh, John? Who was that talking about the wife? Oh, it's your. It's, who's that? It's just you, Jonathan, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you, you are a wise man, right? And uh, I'm a- because you're you're a wise man. Okay. Because <laughs> you have. I'm sorry, I'm getting off my headphones. You're a wise man because you figured out how to how to stay married. Okay. okay. You know, which, which, which you know, which is which is to, uh, you know, it, it may not be the, um, uh, it, it's it, 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 it is, you know what you describe, you know, to to uh, understand, have compassion for your uh, for your wife, and understand you can't tell. You know somebody what they can or cannot, um, you know, um, do as far as church, and, and you know, just basically just exercising you exercising wisdom on that, and um, and okay. restraint, right. and restraint. <laughs> yeah, no, and I don't want to restrain you. But um, but, but what I what I wanted wanted to say, well, you know, you know, I've I've told my story, you know, you know, many times. But people listening to this, you know, they may not, I don't know, they may not believe this. They may not believe that a pastor will go to the links that Andre was just talking about. But you know, just a little bit of, you know, what he was talking about. You know, I know exactly what he's talking about. Um. Yeah. He, uh, I'm sorry. Somebody is distracting me, but yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about because um, I had I actually had a situation. I had my pastor actually 
uh, took out a, well, first of all, I've been to jail like three times, first of all, because of my wife and the pastor and the pastor's wife working wow. together. Wow. Um, I've had wow. restraining orders, like three or four restraining orders taken out on me. Um, the pastor and, the, and his wife were actually uh, new people in the court system. Uh, as a matter of fact, the judge, you know, usually when you go to court, at least in, in the county I live in, when you go to court, let's say if you have a civil case, if you go whatever, ju- if you go before that judge, you all your cases, if you go all your future cases, you tend to go back to this, you go to the same judge. Well, this this judge. Uh, he actually had been to our church uh, for like a, a, a an event, and uh, not only that, but just to make it you know give you paint a larger picture, is that my my dad is a, an attorney, right? So he's been a, a attorney in this ca- in the county I live in for well almost forty years. So he is well known in the legal community, uh, well known in the in the uh, law enforcement community. And, you know, not because he's, like, so awesome or whatever, but because he, he used to handle, like, he used to deal with civil rights cases. And he had a, 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 a civil rights case involving the police where they were not promoting police officers, black police officers. So he was kind of involved in the civil rights, uh, you know, issues. So that's why a lot of people know him, right? So for me to be getting caught up in drama, you know, in the in with the police and the court system, it's like I'm looking crazy. It's making my family look crazy. You see what I'm saying? So it was a lot of pressure. You know, I'm I'm already going through, you know, drama with my wife. I and my problem started basically because I decided to leave the church. And once I decided to leave, it is a tactic that they use. Isn't that isn't that when all the problems to start? try and get you? To, to to submit, right, if they try to get you to come back to church. I believe, I firmly believe that if I had come back to the church, I would not have suffered what I had suffered. Yeah, I, I firmly believe that everything, it was, it was and, and it was also, it's also, you know, I don't know how they find, I, I, I don't know if they go to a school or something, I don't know if they just, if the, if the, 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 Satan just, you know, just <laughs> takes over these people's minds and stuff. But somehow they find a way to, you know, to they find a way to get to uh, bring division between uh, a man and his wife. And and I don't know how they do this, but they, it's I don't know. But I, let me say one more thing, and then I, I'll take a breath. Is that? When, when these things happen, you know they try to make you feel like, you know, or I won't say they, but or yeah, I guess I will say they. They meaning, you know, the, the church particularly, and then just society in general try to tries to make you feel like that you're less than a man, you know, because basically you can't control your woman, right? And mm-hmm. that's not even really a. You know that's not a really a biblical or even a, a, a balanced, you know, view of male female relationship, husband wife relationship anyway. But this society, you know, so you know, so paternalistic in a sense, you know, that you know they make you think like you as the husband, you supposed to control your woman, control your household, and if. She don't act right, or if she does something, it's because of something you did or something you ain't doing, right? And mm-hmm. you know that's a it's a that's a, another layer of pressure because you go through feeling like, well, dang, you know, you you do feel like less than a man sometimes when your wife does not go along with you, right? Not not that you like telling her what to do, but even it's like you know why is she listening to the pastor, you know, more than me? And it does it that weighs on you mentally, you know, and you know. You you have to understand that your your wife is a an individual with her own relationship with God supposedly, you know she has her own responsibilities, you know to live up to what she says, you know, and it doesn't you know it doesn't really have anything to do with you if she does not, you know, 
um, you know, want to, uh, you know, do what is right, you know, and do what is, um, you know, uh, for the for the good of the marriage and the good of the relationship, you know, that's a choice that she made. You know, it's not it's not on you. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there, there may be some things, you know, you may have made some mistakes or whatever, whatever, but generally speaking, if your wife chooses to, to buy everything that the pastor says and, and uh, allows herself to be convinced, you know, that that you're not walking with God just because you're not, if she, if she, she makes those choices, you know, so, um, uh, and, you know, that was, that was something that, you know, uh, that I kind of wrestled with, I kind of had to deal with, because that that thing does try to come on you, you know. But I had I had to say no, and and when and when you do stand, you know, like that, you're going you're going to suffer. It's going to be some consequences, because they're going to do things to try to make you submit, you know, to their authority. They're going to do things to try to discredit you, to show you that, you know, that. What you you basically that you coming against God, right? Mm-hmm. And so they're gonna they're gonna do a lot of stuff, and you know it's it's gonna be rough. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, which, and basically you have to make a choice whether, you know, it, it 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 may very well come down to a choice between, you know, your wife, or, or. Or your, or, or your conscience, or or what or what God has established, you know, and um, you know. So I, I mean, I mean, it, you know, I, like I said, it, it was it was a, it was a it was a lot to deal with. Going to jail, sitting in the cell, wondering, coming into court and seeing your pastor, <laughs> you know, seeing your pastor and his wife, and all the elders in the church, like eight or nine elders who you thought you were, they were your friends that you broke bread with, that you had at your house, right? Deacons, mm-hmm. like 14, 15 people coming into church, and a church paid for attorney, a good one too, coming in, you know, against you. They standing on one side of the courtroom and you standing on the other side of the courtroom by yourself. Now, like you, know, like you did something wrong. Yeah, I mean, I still that that day what I just told you, what I just described, that was literally the worst day of my life. Well, Kevin, uh, I far. mean, yeah. Kevin, now we're, we're we're about eight minutes at, to, towards oh, the top so of the hour, man. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. Hey, um, you're listening to Real Talk Radio. This is the General Kevin Oliver with Church for Revolution, and bro, I know you've done this a million times. I want to leave the floor open. <laughs> For 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 the uh, fellas, in case they want to, you know, say something real quick. And I know you've done this a million times, but bro, we got a lot of new listeners. Oh, I yeah. want you to tell. I want you to tell that story, Kevin, because it's unbelievable. Okay. I want you because you okay. kind of talked around it and you, you and you uh, set it up a little bit. And I think you've got people's curiosity peaked, man. I want you to fill in this this unbelievable story. Just just tell it from top to bottom, sure. and what led you to, you know. Uh, not your typical Negro on uh, on YouTube. And just, just yeah. tell the story, man. All right. So do do you want to let the brothers chime in first before any, I start? Anybody got to, any, anybody else got anything to say real quick? And then after no, I tell the story, we'll, we'll get some we'll get some callers. I'm, in. I'm, 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 I'll chime in after this. Okay. This story right. is unbelievable. I want I want the new listeners to really hear the story. Of the ones that are listening to uh, to us for the first time, man. This story is crazy. All right, Four everybody got your cap. popcorn? <laughs> Time's yours, brother. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm going to try to uh, to be... Uh, condense it? Yeah, I'm going to try to try to condense it because I, 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 I could tell it, tell it, really tell it. So, uh, in, so in 2000, so the church that we're talking about is the, the church of uh, uh, the... One Accord Church of God in Christ, located at 5285 Flat Show Parkway in the city of Decatur, Georgia, where a stranger meets a friend <laughs> right, and right. a sinner meets God. Right, <laughs> right, right. There you go. And the, and the, the pastors was Bishop, is Bishop Doctor T A Body, right? Okay. So it Bishop was? Dr. T. A. Body, so, yeah, Bishop Doctor T A Body. So he was known uh, 
so so and this was a he was known kind of within Kojic, you know, as a you know I guess a, an evangelist. He was kind of he was kind of known in Kojic, right? So anyway, um, so I attended this church during two different periods. I attended this church first in the nineties, uh, and uh, after I returned from the military. Uh, I eventually, you know, found this church, and I was at this church for a few years, about three years. I left not because of anything bad, because my wife at the time didn't like the church, right? So we left. Uh, left on good terms, no big deal. Went to another church, whatever. We got divorced, and uh, and then after a couple of after maybe a year, I kind of was looking to get, you know, back into just basically kind of get reconnected, kind of, you know, get spiritually re- reconnected or whatever. So I went back to one accord in 2001. So it was like the, the year, the week before the September 11th event hit happened, right? So at that time, I when I rejoined, I was immediately busy, right? So, and uh, I was... Uh, 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 working on a radio show with him, I was doing stuff. I basically kind of became like one of his. Uh, I guess you could say sort of like an armor bearer, but that wasn't my. I didn't have a title armor bearer. I was kind of like an executive assistant. To, I was like an adjutant or whatever. I had some kind of title, basically. So I was on a radio show with him every day for like for a few years. I, when he would go to preach, I would go with him. I mean, you know. I, you know, I, I was in there. I was, you know, was I was kind of, you know, and then eventually I met my my uh, second wife uh, went at a church where he went to preach at. Turns out this Sharon was what's her name. She she was known. Or she was a, a friend of the family and best friends with the pastor's daughter. So I'm like, oh, this is cool. You know, she, you know, I saw her at church. You know, at this church she went to, she was fine. She was nice. Talked to her. And she was she she was already cool with the pastor. I was like, all right, so this is all right. Well, it's, uh, okay, okay. So anyway, long story short, we uh, we are we're dating, whatever, whatnot, and we get married. All right. So fast forward after, so she comes and joins me at one accord. So, um, so so I, I meet her in two thousand two. Um, we got married in 2002, and, uh, you know, she came to one accord in 2002, okay? So over the next – so uh, so I I would eventually end up leaving in 2004. So we're talking about a couple of years later. And I end up leaving as, as a result of two things. Number one, over time, I began to see – Pastor Bidey changing from what he, for what he preached, and I, I, I'm seeing that he's you know making prophecies, saying God said thus and so, and these prophecies are not coming to pass. I'm not seeing a lot of inconsistency. You know, things he will be on the radio, you know, preaching against and dealing with the various teachings. He starts teaching this this stuff, so I'm like, hmm, this is a problem, and then. Uh, the the other reason is has to has to do specifically with things he was doing. Well, what's happening with money? It was this one evening. So one evening where um, he asked the congregation for eighteen thousand dollars to save his home. Right? He was asking for eighteen people to give a thousand dollars. Now, now before I continue with that. As I'm seeing these things that are happening, you know, I'm discussing this this stuff with my wife. So I, I really start having a problem with things I'm seeing within the last six months, you know, a few months before I leave. I'm having sort of like a crisis of conscience, conscience, right? And I'm saying I don't know about this, you know. So I'm talking to these things, talking to these things, mentioning things with my wife. She's telling me, you know, well. Basically, she did not. She didn't want to hear it. She, she said, "Well, I choose not to question it." And little do, do, do I know, I'm finding out. I find out later that she is going back 
and discussing these things with the pastor's wife <laughs> and her best friend, who is the her best friend or one of her best friends, who is the pastor's daughter. So basically, it's a pipeline directly to to the pastor. So all this time, I'm being sort of, you know, the spotlight is on me, and I'm kind of being undermined. Basically, it, it kind of really started like really in the last couple like couple of months is really when it starts happening, right? So. I noticed I'm kind of getting the cold shoulder and, you know, some things. But I didn't realize that that was the reason why it was happening. So, anyway, back to this one particular night where this is the night where pretty much the straw that broke the camel's back is the pastor is asking for this, these 18 people to give a thousand uh, $1,000 to save his home. So, in, in this is during a Bible study, so a Wednesday night Bible study. So, I stand up and ask, not because I'm suspicious, but I, I was concerned. I was like, one, because I know that the church is paying for his house. The house is in the church's name. I, you know, because, you know, once you, like, get sort of, like, like close to, a, you know, a certain level or you get to the inner right. circle or you get certain places, you begin right. to you become aware of more of how, you know, what's going on. What's 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 really going on? And I still was not really in the real inner 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 circle, but I was sort of close. I was in there, even though I had the title, uh, a title would, would, that would put me in the inner circle. I wasn't really in it quite just yet. You know how you can tell. You can tell when you're in the inner circle because certain things are discussed. You know, you get a, you know, people are more relaxed and they they talk. I wasn't quite there yet. So I knew I wasn't in the inner circle, and I wasn't really trying to be. So anyway, I ask about, so I stand up in the middle of Bible study, and I say, excuse me, Pastor. I said, um, you know, will, will there ever come a time when, you know, we'll be explained exactly what's going on with your home? Very respectful tone, whatever. I wasn't accusing. And, and when I asked that question, my wife was sitting next to me. Everybody... The church was in an uproar. I wish you, oh man. I wish you could. I wish that I could describe what what it was like. But it was like, it was like, uh, uh, like being in a. Um, uh, <laughs> it was like if I like if I was in a, a a room full of vampires and I pulled a cross out. Right. It was. It was very. It was total pandemonium. That I would wow. stand up and ask this question, right? And I look at my wife and she cringes, right? And I'm wondering, like, well, you know, what was so bad about what I asked, right? Because right. I'm on the radio with him every day. We talking, asking questions. We on a talk show. I'm asking him questions all the time. I'm on. I'm the guy with the title. We we in the meetings with the pastors. I'm I'm Elder Oliver. You know, I'm Elder like them. We talking stuff. I'm I'm always asking questions. So I was wondering what the what the big deal was, right? And um, you know, some so people were saying you don't have to answer that question, Pastor. And it was all kind of crazy. It was crazy. And so he he said no. He said I'm going to answer him. And he said uh, he said well, the home was obtained under unique circumstances. And he said that and. I didn't want to it, it, something it, something happened. He said, and I didn't want to burden church with it. And he said, and besides, it's none of your business anyway. And I said, well, excuse me, Pastor. I said, but I disagree. And then there was like a gasp in the room. And then <laughs> I said, I said, because, I said, you know, because you know we're you know we're 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 helping to you know pay for that. And I said, and then. Somebody else got up. It, it, I won't go through the rest of what what was dis, what was discussed, but basically, I was basically told that basically it was none of my business, and the pastor didn't really have to explain. All right, so that was the end of that. So mm -hmm. after this incident, that's when basically, uh, you know, I was persona non grata after that, and I could I felt that, but I was so naive at the time, I didn't understand, like, why, what the question, now, the only per after I asked that question, we have, we have one white person in our church, the only person that came up to me after church and said, 
hey, um, I had the same question too. I don't see anything what was wrong with the question that you asked, right? The, the one mm-hmm. white dude was the one person who said that to me. And, you know, you know, the side commentary on that is that, you know, in, in many, you know, white churches, you know, the question I asked would have been like normal. They, they, it's a, it's a cultural thing, you know, with black churches that, you know, that, there's certain things that supposedly, that supposedly we can't ask about, and there's certain information that we are not we can't have because we don't have a title, we're not on the right board, or whatever. So, right. so culturally, so so it was really interesting that you know that he came up to me and he 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 said that to me. But but anyway, so um, I was persona non grata not only in my church, but I was also persona non grata in my home after that. And wow. again, I'm naive. I'm not wonder. I'm wondering why after that my wife is not acting right, why she has an attitude, why things are you know unraveling in my home, and I, I'm realizing it it was because of her going and had the, carrying this stuff back in these back channels between the pastor and and and, and so I was undermined began to be undermined long before I even asked that question you see what I'm saying mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so the work was already done so so and I'm I'm not and, and I became aware of things because one of my wife's best friends came to me on the side because she knew me and she was letting me know the stuff that was happening all the while, but she wasn't sure because she, you know, she, be, she believed what my wife was saying. So, so come to find out this picture is being painted that, that I have gone crazy and, oh, man. and, and that I have gone crazy because I am now disagreeing and questioning with the pastor. She's also saying that uh, she's afraid of me. That uh, and she even told uh, there was another like the brother was saying Andre was saying earlier she uh, there was a, a one time where she um, uh, she called the police on me <laughs> oh, uh, she called she called the police on me um, because we we didn't really have an argument well we kind of had an argument and I basically told her off. I said, mm-hmm. listen, I said, you know, you spend all this time in this church, you're doing this, you're doing that. You, I said, you know what? I said, you know, basically, it was a basically I told her off, right? She didn't like what I said. She went and called the pastor. I find this out later. I didn't know this at the time. She called the pastor and the, uh, the pastor's wife or whatever and told them that that I spoke to her in a certain way and that she was afraid. They told her to call the police on me. Police came. I didn't know the police was coming. I'm on the computer working. Police come, and they talk to me, talk to her, and I'm, like, totally clueless as to why they're there. And long story short, they left. After that, her two brothers, who are from Chicago, known thugs, you know, <laughs> they I mean, in the game deep, right, Mm-hmm. They because they moved to Atlanta to get away from the game, but they were still really in it. She called. She called and told them that I had jumped on her and all of this stuff. Right? They came to my house again. I I'm on the computer working. They come to the come in. I was like, "What's up, fellas?" You know, because I'm thinking we cool. And they say, "Yeah, we just want to talk to you, man. See what's going on." I'm talking to them. You know, little do I know at the time. They both had their pieces on them, and one of them had they had they had some on them. They came to do damage, right? Wow! I'm talking to them, and I was like, "Yeah, we just you know we just had a little you know nothing." I said, to me. I said "The police came." I said, and they left. I said, "Did she did she tell you guys that?" They looked at each other like, "Whoa!" And they realized that she had lied to them, right? And the reason I'm telling you this amount of detail is because. This woman almost got me killed. She not only did she almost she got me. She she was actively trying to get me locked up. There was another incident after that where she tried to get me locked up. So after I began to see what was happening, I said, "You know what? It's time for me to go." Right. 
Mm-hmm. So I I moved out, uh, got an apartment. I left everything uh, and moved out. And uh, I wrote a resignation letter simultaneously to one accord. So I left the church and I left my wife at the same time. And I moved out on Christmas Day of December 2014. Mm. For the next... For the next nine months, right, um, I I was arrested. Over the next nine months, I was arrested three times for nothing because she she told the police that I was at her house. Um, I had four or five restraining orders taken out because she was lying saying it's 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 too much stuff to go in, too much detail to go into but she would say things like i would come up to her job and like i was now i will tell you this this part one of those arrests um is she went and took out a restraining order and i don't and i don't understand why the, the judges are granting restraining orders for, for nothing that's mm-hmm. a whole another story she goes and gives a restraining order, and the process is she goes to court. She's supposed to fill out a complaint to basically say w- what I did or said to put her in fear of her life. She would go and put things like he called my house and or uh, he went to my daughter's school without permission, these kind of things. And the judge is g- will grant her a restraining, a temporary restraining order, which means then I get served, then I have to come to court, right? Well, in between the time that we're supposed to, I'm supposed to come to court. The first she calls and says, tells a lie and says I'm up at her job, harassing her. Now, so the police come and arrest me because of that. I am then in. Uh, they don't investigate to find out if I was really at her job. They just move the process along, and I be, be get I get indicted on felony stalking. Indicted for felony oh stalking. Oh my god, man! Wow, oh. bro. So for wow. a year and a half, I'm caught up in the legal system, and it, eventually the charge is dismissed for lack of evidence. Why? Because I wasn't there. Mm-hmm. The security cameras showed I wasn't there, and on top of that, she wasn't there. So what? Amazing. Yeah, she wasn't there. Um, so that was one key incident. Another key incident where, you know, no, wait, 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 wait. Hold on, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. Hold on, Kevin. Yeah. Did she yeah. suffer any repercussions for falling false claims? I'm I'm glad you asked that question. Okay. No, she didn't. I talked to the prosecutor. I said, and and no, the short answer is no. It's wow. very, it's. That's one of the, you know, of course we know that's one of the big flaws in the legal system. If somebody lies on you, you know, I, I mean, they're, they're not going to, they're just going to not pursue it. They're just not going to deal with it. Hmm. So wow. now, wow. Um, now I address that later. Um, and then um, another, uh, another key incident is one I mentioned earlier. I filed for divorce eventually. And uh, I went through a custody battle, and uh, and in one of the cases where I, where I went to court for the divorce, this is where I'm in court. I sit, I file, I serve her. We have there's supposed to be a hearing. She doesn't come, uh, and then you know the process moves along, and then uh, what, several months later. So we're now a year later from when I moved out. Mm-hmm. I'm at I'm at what I think is the final divorce hearing where I'm going to get my divorce. This is where she shows up with the pastor, the pastor's wife, ten elders from my church, from the church, a couple of deacons, uh, and a church paid for attorney. Basically says. Uh, Basically, this is not going down like this, and we challenged and everything. So basically, uh, you know, I'm I'm thinking I'm going to be divorced that day, but 
Now the process is starting all over again because this lawyer files all these different papers and stuff. Now, simul- so this is that's why I say this is the this is like the worst day of my life because I never saw this coming. I got all of these people who I thought were like my friends at one point now, and and they're in court backing her up, right? In the meantime, she's telling all kinds of lies that I that I. At different times, I've threatened her that I have jumped on her and all this different stuff. So these, these she, they're backing her up because of these lies that she's telling, right? Why is she telling these lies? Because she needs financial support. So if she plays the victim role, the church is going to give her a job, which they gave her a job. They're going to give her money so she can keep up her lifestyle. So basically that's what that was all about. Man. So, you know, it's it's you know, it's real it's real deep. And then um so uh, so so that was so that was that. So kind of just to kind of like you know, sum up everything, you know, I, basically for like a year and a half after I moved out, I went through hell on the family front because of restraining orders, going back and forth to court. I've been to court like 18 times. I was had been arrested 3 times. I had a felony indictment hanging over my head. Um, I would I would uh, go to, um, you know, my, the type of work that I do, it requires you to be able to pass a background check, right, because I work in hospitals and healthcare setting and different things. I would go for jobs to I, I interview, think I'm going to, and they say, oh, we can't hire you because you have this open, so you hope this open charge on your record. So now it's hitting me economically, you know, and I have to pay child support, you know, support my children, and I can't bring in the type of money, you know, that I need to do that because I'm going through this. So I'm suffering on the family front. I'm suffering, and then I'm suffering on the church side because the pastor, PA body, is basically preaching against me from the pulpit. You know, prophesying, saying that I'm going to die because I, I didn't uh, obey him, obey what the church wow. said. Now, y'all joked about the Kevin Oliver spirit. It was literally <laughs> right. preached. Yes, it was literally preached from the pulpit of the One Accord Church. There was a, a particular day where it's, where the pastor was in the pulpit or whatever, and he got frustrated, whatever, and he said, now, and the reason he got frustrated is because the deacons, a couple of deacons, they're seeing all of this stuff happening in the aftermath of me leaving, and they're they're like, we know Kevin. It's like this stuff that we're saying, this stuff that his share, his wife is saying, this stuff is not lining up, right? So they start mm-hmm. asking questions. They start questioning financial things in the church. Things people begin to start questioning things. So this leads to this one particular day where he is frustrated and he rebukes the Kevin Oliver spirit. The Kevin wow. Oliver spirit is this spirit of asking questions about things, of, of questioning him. So he said, I rebuke this Kevin Oliver spirit. I, now, I'm not at the church. I have been gone for six <laughs> months. I hadn't done anything. I'm out here trying to work and trying to get on with my life. But right. I'm being preached against because he thinks, I guess, that I poisoned people's minds while I was there and made them question him. So now he doesn't like this. And for, I don't know what the specific incident that brought this on, but I do know one of the deacons said in the deacons meeting they had been talking about some things. And the one brother said, isn't this what Kevin Oliver said when he what he was talking about before he left? He actually said this in the deacons meeting. So then – he rebukes this Kevin Oliver spirit, and I think people start shouting and whatever and speaking in tongues and and all this other stuff. It was crazy. It was crazy. So oh, now no. and multiple people told me this, that this is what happened. They told me this like, now, and this is actually documented in court records. Why is this documented in court records? Because eventually – because of the church, the church kept being inf- involved in my interfering with my family affairs and influencing my wife and all this other stuff they were doing. Um, one time, the the pastor's wife, oh, 
let me mention this. I told you a, a few moments ago about when I was in divorce court, I'm thinking I'm going to get divorced, and all these elders show up, right? Little did I know that a week before, the pastor's wife went and tried to take out a restraining order on me. She claimed what? that I had come to their house, that I was harassing the pastor, that I had been calling the church, harassing them, that I had threatened some people's lives. It was like a whole list, laundry list of things I did, right? She did not get the restraining order because the judge didn't believe what she was saying. It, it, uh, it dis, dismissed the restraining order, dismissed it. He said, well, because he asked her, I found out we were, basically he asked her a series of questions, and it was not granted. granted. So um, so anyway, so all of these things, I'm, I'm experiencing all of this stuff, so eventually I, I figure, and then, not only is this church against me, but I, I mentioned earlier that I was a person with a title, and I so I I interacted and had relationships with several other pastors because I, we had this fellowship, which we had these churches under us. So I was like a liaison with these different pastors. So not only was my entire church against me, but I had the leadership of like ten churches against me. So I, so I had those churches and those pastors turned against me as well. So, you know, so after a while, I figure I've got to make these people stop somehow. So mm -hmm. I I file a civil, I file a lawsuit for defamation and invasion of privacy. Basically, I filed this lawsuit, and I had them serve. I tried to have them serve with it. They wouldn't accept service. And I ended up hiring a private um I gotta tell you this part because it's funny. I ended up hiring a private you can hire a private uh like a detective to go and serve somebody like people that didn't try to resist getting served. Mm -hmm. He he went to the church on a Sunday. And then because he figured that was the only way he could get them served. He went on Sunday and then he walked up to the pastor, pastor's wife, and uh, asked him and served him with the papers, and he said the church members surrounded him and yelled at him, and he said he was in, like in fear of his life. He said it was crazy, and he and he so he you know he ended up getting out of there. He was like man, he was so shaken by it. He was like man, he said I'm you you did the right thing getting out of there. So just that's just to give you a glimpse of how you know how crazy these people are. So anyway, I filed a lawsuit against them, and they didn't show up in court, so I won that lawsuit. I also filed a lawsuit against my ex-wife. I had to do that because all of these charges and stuff that she had out there on me, you know, I had been to court and I had these restraining, all this stuff on the court records and stuff. I had to file a lawsuit to address all of these charges that were out on me because if I ever, you know, wanted to get a job or I wanted to say if I wanted to go back in ministry or I wanted to be involved in something, uh, you know, dealing with the community or whatever, I needed to be able to, to explain, you know, what, you know, what this stuff was about. Anyway, I sued my ex-wife. I want to, she never, she didn't show up to court either. Uh, I sued her for false imprisonment. Uh, for defamation, for like a whole bunch of stuff. I won a judgment of $2,500. Ironically, from the same judge who I had gone before for all these restraining orders and who had previously been at my church. You know, at the, at, at, and, and at that, and at that, um, um, the, the hearing the, where I was, Granted, where I was awarded my judgment, he looked at me and he said, "Man, he said, he said, he said, he said, Mr. Oliver, he said, I'm really sorry, because he he had realized, you know, all those times I had been back and forth in court, him seeing me, you know, where he he real he really believed that, you know, because you know the saying where smoke there's fire, right? I think he was mm -hmm. really believing all of this stuff about me. He and once he we got 
the court and he saw all of this stuff, he then realized that, you know, uh, you know, what I had gone through and that basically, and I'm, I'm just speculating here, that he played some part in it because as a judge, you know, I feel like, you know, he could have, you know, put an end to this foolishness. I think, you know, I, this is another side commentary. You know, I think judges, you know, they see stuff, they get kind of jaded, and they just get caught up in the process, and they just kind of just go along. But they don't really listen, you know, a, a lot of times to stuff and really dig in stuff when they should. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you know, my wife, she should have been shut down on her foolishness long ago. You know, the past, all of them people should have been shut. That should have been shut down long, long before. So, you know, so that was mentally, that was sort of like the beginning of the process for me to kind of let go of some things because, and and actually after that, they left me alone after that because, wow. you know, I guess they figured that, you know, that they um, that they couldn't beat me you know, that I wasn't coming back, you know, and uh, that if they they kept messing with me, yeah, (laughs) if they kept messing with me, they would end up in some more trouble. You know, so basically, so, so I guess I can put a pin in the story there, but that's basically what happened. And, and, um, you know, I haven't been back to one accord. You know, the pastor has tried to reach out to me. Uh, uh, Oh, and uh, uh, I will also say, that um, after that lawsuit, the plan was to just, you know, go on with my life and move on. And, um, you know, I, I didn't want to say anything. I didn't want to talk about them. But what ended up happening was and I would go on to then make start video blogging on YouTube. Mm-hmm. But, but it wasn't. And when I started blogging on the, on YouTube under this name, Not Your Typical Negro, right, I wasn't even talking about one accord. I wasn't even talking about the church. What mm-hmm. I started doing was I wanted I started to uh, – I was trying to recreate sort of like a forum, an online forum, create this online forum that was sort of loosely based on uh, – Tavis Smiley is a commentator. He used to do these symposiums called State of the Black Union – Mm-hmm. and State of the Black Church in the early 2000s, right? And then he kind of stopped doing it like around, like I think his last one was like 2004, right? So 2007, I discovered this YouTube thing, like you could go on and you could make videos. And I said, you know, it would be kind of good to kind of like, uh, you know, do some, I just wanted to just open up some dialogue on just church in general, you know, and it was, you know, based on, you know, you know, things that I went through and some observations. So I kind of started, that's what I started doing. And then uh, after after a while, so I kind of did that for a couple of years. And then after about a couple of years, one of the members, a young lady that I knew as a teenager from my old church, from One Accord, and she's been on, Church Folk Revolution, she, she's been on the show. She's in the archives. Her name is Michaela. She reached out to me and basically tells me that my former pastor had molested her for several years as a teenager. Mm. Mm. Now, I, and she, you know, she tells me these stories, and I believe her, but, and then, I make a video where I discuss this, and another woman sees the video, emails me, and tells me that my former pastor molested her at a Kojic youth convention in the 70s, Mm. and that she had documented it in a book that she wrote. And I read the book, and the incident is described, but he's not named. And so then I'm like, okay, so this is so for this is when I began to then openly blog and talk about my experiences at the One Accord Church. 
And I did this series called Profile of an Abusive Church where I talked about those experiences. I, I, I And then I think around that time I joined up with a, a you know, Church Folk Revolution I, uh, uh, with TJ and, and, and had been doing with the show. And then just over the years from then until now, you know, there have been different uh, occasions where I have talked about you know my experiences at the Winter Court Church, like as 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 in today. So mm-hmm. I've talked a lot about you know my my experiences there, and then you know through talking about it, you know people like didn't believe me like the, the stuff that I was talking about. Like when I started on YouTube, when I started talking about stuff that it was taboo even then to name a pastor, to say anything. Like you know. When you leave a church or you have a bad experience, the church just wants you to shut up about it. They don't want you talking about it. You know, they want you to just go on and let the Lord handle it, and you're just not supposed to say nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, and, mm-hmm. and I actually w- was not going to say anything until I find out that basically this man is evil, you know. And, you know, that was another, you know, that was, so that was like another blow, you know, because. You know, it's it's a because you 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 have you have people in your life that, on one hand, they have a positive impact on you, right? Which my former pastor did. I learned a lot from him, you know, and I he, I developed under him as a young minister. But then, you know, I, you know, I I saw that he was a flawed man, mm-hmm. you know, but. And and that's one thing, you know, you don't throw people away because they're flawed, because they disappoint you. But then I find out that he's corrupt, you know, you know. So that was that was a blow as well, you know. So right, yeah. So so um, so I will kind of, I guess, kind of, you know, take a breath there. And so that's that's kind of the, the story. Wow, um, man. All right. Yeah. yeah, we're talking about we're talking about us spiritually divided families, man, and all of that that you just heard yeah. from Kevin Oliver, all of that is just because that this brother <laughs> had the audacity to ask a question of the pastor, and yep. his household was divided right down the middle. His his wife was more loyal to the pastor than she was to Kevin. And I mean, this this is the type of stuff that we're talking about, man. And if you if you're on Facebook, following us on Facebook on this thread, man, drop your comments in there. Let us know what you what you think, and uh, also in the chat room too. And uh, you know, give us a call six six one four four nine 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 five one if you want to comment live, um, fellas. I mean, that that, that story, man, yeah, can't be told yeah. a thousand times, but it's 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 it, it, now, it's unbelievable, man. It's crazy. Now, all right, I want to say I want to say something very quickly about my 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 former wife right now after they they after they used her up you know they they used her up that that which is a whole whole another story but they used her as a tool used her up and basically you know hung her out to dry so she eventually left as well but like right now today we cool i mean you know i mean <laughs> You know we ha- we have a, you know we have a daughter who's a wonderful daughter. She's you know thirteen, just turned thirteen. Whatever I ask her to do, you know she does it. We can, we get along better. You know there there you know probably you know various reasons for that, but she has not really, but she has not acknowledged or mentioned anything at all. We have not had a discussion from that day. Well, that's that's two thousand. I left her in December 2014. Uh, I'm sorry, 2004. I left her in December 2004. So that's what 12 years. From that day until now, we we have not had any discussion about any any of what I just told you. She has not acknowledged that it happened. And you know, her psychological makeup as far as like how she deals with things. She she's one of those types of people. She blocks things out mentally. That's how she she moves through life. She blocks things out, and that's how she you know she functions. And so you know you know I don't bring it up. You know so and we we just don't talk about it. So we when we so when we interact, it's like none of this stuff ever happened. 
You know, it's amazing. Hey, wow. LL. LL, you got a story? Yeah, um, let's go drop the one. Um, my experience I had back in 2010. So I had left the church uh, 2005, actually. That's when I actually started studying on my own. And only went back because I was dating uh, a, a woman that was heavy into the church. I just figured, you know, they're not going to put me back in. I'll just go a couple of Sundays and just see what it is. But since we started the date and she was uh, – her father was the apostle when she was the head pastor under him. She wanted me to come more frequently, like uh, not frequently as in more days, but just Sundays because I wasn't going all the time. So I figured, yeah, why not? Um, this is how we got divided, though, um, as far as our relationship, because at first I didn't sense any MCD in her at all. She they she stayed strict to the Bible, but the rest of the family was kind of up and down as far as what the church was doing. Um Right around the time that our relationship became shaky was when her father tried to enter it. And by entering it, I mean actually letting uh, his pulpit take over and control of what we were doing. And this all happened based on me asking one question, uh, one particular Bible study, which was, when did Tyler become money? And, of course, that was just the wrong thing to do. But ever since that day, the Uh MCD started to affect her. (laughs) It was coming out of her, like, through her pores at that point where I could tell no biblical truth. All of a sudden, I became uh, this this damnable Christian. This, if I speak this anywhere else, it's heresy. Um, and he started to, um, I guess, kind of take over in, in control of her because she would tell me stuff like, well, you know, my father don't agree with that. And, um, that's not how that really is in the Bible. And uh, as a matter of fact, the moment I asked that question, uh, her entire family chewed me up because this is her father's church, so it's her aunties, uh, her mother's there, her brother's there, her sister's as well. So, I mean, you could hear a pin drop when I asked that question. And once her father started chewing it to me, the rest of the family did as well. And after church, everyone acted like everything was just copacetic, like nothing happened between <laughs> them snapping on me and calling me everything but a child of God. And then when we all exited the church, oh, yeah, no, what's up? So what are we doing tomorrow? Like, now, we're not shooting basketball, people. This is not how this goes. Um, so I'm saying all that to say that our whole dynamic uh, of our relationship shifted immediately upon yep. that day. And um, granted, when I left church, I left MCD and all of that stuff alone, so I wasn't pulled back into it. But to have been pulled back into it like that, like to show me how it would have been had I been her husband or someone a little bit deeper to it and, and at that point, and she would have been more into church than I would have, I probably would have, like, some would have happened. Like, I probably would have snapped, not on her. Like, I'm not a destroyer or killer or anything like that. But I can see how it is for people who have a, a wife or a husband in the church and how you're just losing yourself a day at a time because that's what started to happen. It Eventually, what her father had done to her was being done to me, and it was affecting me as a man. Not that I was trying to pull her out because I knew I could That's her whole blood is in that uh, church, but that's just the way it is, man. It's it's horrible when you have to fight the system that you left in order to try to appease somebody, or actually, no, try to blend yeah. in with the system, I guess, uh, to appease somebody, to try to get them to see the light. So I tried yeah. to become like Paul was unto the people anything in order to get people to see, but I couldn't get our people to see nor her. So I just ended that relationship all together, feel so much better for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. And, and I'm, I'm glad you said that, uh, you know, about the family aspect, because we rarely look at that aspect of it. You know, how difficult must it be for a family, let's say a junior, for, even though there's hierarchies in the family, there's hierarchies. You know, you got the grandparents and the parents and aunts, uncles, and you got the little cousins and all this stuff. But there's always a hierarchy, but it's worse when it's in a, um, when the family runs a church, the family run church. So oh, let's yeah. say... Let's say you are in the church. No, no, let's say I'm in the church, and my uncle, because I think Leonard was in there, where his, his uncle was, was the pastor, you know, and let's say y'all were close growing up, and you did everything. You was a nice little boy, uh, and, you know, you obeyed all the rules, and you was in Bible study, you sung in the choir, but then God opened up your eyes to the truth about the system, and you have to exit stage left. How difficult must that be? You know, at family reunions, at barbecues, uh, you know, at birthday parties and stuff, where you have left the church, 
and your family has shunned you. It looks down on you. You know, they call your name, you're the devil, and, you know, you're a lone wolf, all the stuff. You know, we have, we've all been called those kind of names. Uh, you know, the mm-hmm. devil done got us. Um, how difficult must that be? Uh, uh, we know that the spousal relationship is difficult, but what about when you, you know, people you grew up with your whole life and you left? You know? I got a. Go, go ahead, ahead, bro. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I have, a, I have a friend who's a, a, a preacher's kid, and uh, that's what he was to his family. He became the black sheep the moment he left. Uh, he didn't leave and join any other cults or anything like that. He's still a Christian. He just was fed up with the system of church, uh, like we pretty much are. And he knows he's a black sheep of the family. He like they they stomach him, uh, and and that's odd to me because like you were saying before, this is your blood. Like the, you you your father and your mother birthed you, but now they can only stomach you. It's not like there's mm. true love and passion for their son anymore because he left the church. That system is so perverse. That it separates sons and, and 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 daughters from mothers and fathers, and I know that's what Christ came to to do, and that's precisely yep. what's going on. But that it's there should be a bigger look into the hypocrisy of the church when people are going through stuff like this. It should tell people that this is real. Like if if your own mother and father can disown you because of the fact that they have horrible doctrine, something is wrong with the system. Something is wrong with church. Mm-hmm. Yep. And we actually did a show called Preacher's Kid with our friend uh, Dustin, uh, and it's mm-hmm. in the archives. You can check it out on YouTube. It's called Preacher's Kid. Um, and his father uh, was a pastor, still is a pastor, and he's left the system. But what Dustin was saying was inside his family, his family unit was strong enough to survive that. And he could still have the discussions with his dad, but they, they're still close right. because of the way they grew up and the way he raised his family. And I think that's the way I kind of, when I was in leadership, I raised my family like that. I didn't put all those pressures on my uh, on my kid to be preacher's kid, to be PK, to be the best. I let my kids be kids, and I kept all that pressure to me. I didn't put that pressure on them to be perfect and, you know, be in church. The only thing I had them to do in church was to not act up. That was it. Right. And to, and to come. But mm-hmm. I didn't put all the extra pressure on I didn't make them be, uh, you know, be so super perfect and, and all this, you know. And you've seen it in church where sometimes some of these um, preacher's kids where they are under so much pressure. Even Remember the TV show they had called Preacher's Daughters? All the pressure they put on, on these kids to act and be a certain way, and it's fake because it's not who they are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But just, I mean, put yourself in their shoes, though. Uh, just imagine that. Or, or what if what if your 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 you know if, if you are the pastor and God opened up your eyes and now you got this whole congregation looking up to you and you want to leave? I think it was Francis Chan he left his big mega church. How difficult must that have been for him? Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. right. what do you do in that situation? I mean now now your wife mad at you because you don't left the church. Now you, you know all your money. You ain't gonna be getting all the money and the accolades, all the stuff you get. But then you're gonna have some people who're gonna believe you and follow you. But then some people will be ready to throw you under the bus. I knew something was wrong with him. You know, <laughs> I, I, it's hard for me to put myself in a situation because you know I didn't. We didn't grow up in a, a, a church family like that, so I, I can't speak on that from personal experience. But I know that it has to be difficult. It has to be. Yeah, brothers and sisters not talking to each other. Uh, nieces and nephews uh, not talking to their aunts and uncles. Parents disowning their children, you know. And this is stuff created by the system. We're, mm-hmm. we're supposed to be a body of Christ, but it's not. But people don't look at this side of it. They don't. They, they refuse right. to see it or they can't see it. You know, it's the, it, it's the underbelly of the system. And, you know, what do you do? What do you do when you're in that situation? Who do you talk to? You don't have anybody in your surrounding area that can understand the position that you're in. All you could do is go on Facebook or go on YouTube and listen to other people talk about it, but you don't have anybody you could come and sit face to face and you can cry, just cry on the shoulders and say, man, why they treat me like this? You don't have anybody like that. The difficulty in that, but there is 
hope for you. Not not saying that you're hopeless, but you know, for people in that situation, forms like this, um, where you can contact somebody and you might not have to be in it, but you can reach somebody. I'm pretty sure anybody on this panel will be glad to talk to anybody in that situation just to talk them through it. Yep. And you probably got a lot of stuff on your chest that you want to get off, you know, because you, you got questions. You got questions. What do I do now? What do I do? You know, they ain't talking to me no more. We was, you know, tight. Kevin talks about that. He, I thought y'all was my friends. Now y'all on the other side. Used to be my homie. Wow. Now you act like you don't know me. No, what no. are you doing? <laughs> wow, wow, wow. <laughs> you know, what are you, you know, doing? You know, when I, you know, when I, w- when I was going through my situation, right, that was that was a point in my life where I realized that I that basically all of my friends were in church and that that was not a good thing. The 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 one person the one person my my best friend was you know was not in my church he was outside of my church right he was like the only person that if I if I had not had him to you know to talk to. Um, you know, to keep me balanced, man. I don't know what I w- you know would have done because, you know, you know your family is there. Your family love you, but some like sometimes you know you feel like your family. There's some things your family won't understand, right? And then in in my case, you know, my wife with them, she was like so good. Not only did she she had like the the, the church and the pastor you know the palm of her hand, but she was telling my my family members turn turn. Suddenly, trying to turn my own family members against me, right? Mm. So, you know, when like when I would go tell them stuff, you know, so it, so I I didn't I literally did feel like I didn't have anybody to talk to, um, you know, during that time of my life. And then, and then my you know my my best friend, you know, he had a you know he just had a family, his wife and family, children, whatever. And I ain't like want to be like dumping a whole bunch of stuff on him and like. Tell him, you know, burdening him with all my stuff. So I, I would tend to like pull back and 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 sort of basically, you know, uh, you know, tell him, you know, yeah, everything was cool. You know, I was handling it when I really it was some days I really was not handling, it, you know. So um, so it, so I'm saying that to say that, you know, church folks, Christians, you know. Everybody in church people, church people are not the people with supreme wisdom, right? There are people that are not saved, that are not Christian. There are people outside of your church, you know, that you can actually get along with, that you can actually, you know, be friends with and, and listen to, and you can actually learn from and, and, and gain wisdom from. You know, you shouldn't, it's not a healthy, it's not healthy, in, in my opinion, you know, to to have all of your friends in your church or even all of your friends to be just Christians. You know, there's, there's, there's value in, in, in being able to hear, you know, from different, not saying you have to believe everything else, but there's, you know, being out in the world, you know, our mission as, as believers is supposed to be, and our mission and our ministry is supposed to be to the world. Right, so we need to be able to engage the world, not be Mm-mm. cut off from the world. Right, Kurt Franklin, so, Kanye West. Right, <laughs> so the more we we're cut off from the world, that's that that that, that ha- hampers our ability to be able to engage and and win and influence people. Mm-hmm. You know, right. how are you going to be able to do that if you only know church lingo? If you only know, right. you, you you know what I'm saying? So. So I, that was a, a valuable lesson that I learned. Mm. Mm. All right. We got this caller. We got a caller. Uh, says restricted. So I don't know what area code you're calling from, but you are live on Real Talk Radio. What's your name and comment? Caller from the pen. <clears throat> yeah, I'm calling my cell phone from the pen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the hit man. He done arrested him, bro. <laughs> Well, we thought you yeah, was calling I mean, from Rikers or something, boy. Well, I mean, I'm in here getting swole, man, with that Kevin Oliver spirit, man. You know, it's <laughs> What's good, bro? Man, hey, Talk to us, man. It's a great show, man. I, I, yeah, every time I hear Kevin's story, I always listen to it. And, you know, I'm just hearing it for the first time, man, because it's 
It's so unbelievable. I mean, it's like the poster yeah. child for being excommunicated. <laughs> That's yeah, a lifetime so movie. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Yep. We need to start shooting that bad boy, man, <laughs> immediately. You know, because, you know, I had situations similar to Kevin, but not as – they never got as drastic in terms of going to court and all these other things. I have, you know, spread with different things of that sort and whatnot. And I know what it's like, man, to have an entire church community or people who you thought were once on your side turn against you. But in the end, the one thing I have learned is that if you walk in integrity before the people, in the end, that will always defend you or stand for you. Because if people are really put to the fire, you know, they have to tell the truth, you know, when they're forced to tell the truth. They can't say that, you know, well, no, he didn't really do this or do that. You know, and the truth, eventually, it always ends out even it takes longer to come out than to lie. I mean, the truth loves the marathon, lies do the hundreds. They sprint out right away. But, you know, I went through the same thing, man. My ex-wife was an employee of the church. And when I decided that I would no longer be a part of the system because of all of the corruption I saw behind the scenes, you know, that's when things begin to turn against me. And I, I've noticed that through my experience and through the experiences of others, what happens is when churches see that a man in particular, and a married man, decides to go a different way or change his mind, or he has this kind of a spiritual awakening, it, it reminds me of the Garden of Eden, how Satan studied Adam and Eve and then decided which one to approach first to bring about their downfall. And it's almost like ministries know instinctively, go after the wife. Yep. Either we're going to reel the husband in through her or we're going to make him expendable and keep her because we got to save face. So rather than come to the situation and help the couple or address the situation, you know, biblically, they choose, pick and choose sides. And, I mean, it's amazing that there are more the Christian Christianity among Christians, the divorce rate is so high. Which that should be a red flag to anyone that what's being taught in our churches and what's going on is not right. Right. Because there are more churches that are helping divide or helping people get divorces than there are helping people stay married. And they put on the little mm. show, they tell these pastors sell their books, how to stay married and do a wonderful life, you know, and all this crazy stuff and, and have all these seminars and classes. But it's like a revolving door. People come to the classes, buy the books, and still get divorced. So it, it lets me know that this stuff is for show. Because if it was genuine, if it was, if it was real, then you would see you would see something different happening. But the trend hasn't changed. You come to church, get saved, give your life to the Lord, meet somebody wonderful, get divorced. Or you come to church, man, for I don't know how many years you were happy, and then eventually somebody get involved in your marriage at the church, like the pastor or his wife, and you end up divorced. So it, it's like if you, it's almost like you have to tell people, look, if you want to stay married, don't go to this church. If you want to stay happily married, don't talk to the pastor. Or mm. as soon as they say mm-hmm. amen, get out, leave the parking lot right away. Don't go to none of these social functions because these people will get involved in your business and try to get you, you know, um, hooked in a certain function, and then the next thing you know, you find out all these other types of things that are going on behind the scenes. And the thing, one of the things that Kevin said that really got to stuck with me was when he said, you know, he understood that the past, his, past, his former pastor was flawed. All of us are flawed. But you don't, like you said, you don't throw people away because they're flawed. But when he found out he was corrupt, that was mm. the issue. And that's the issue with these ministries. They are mm-hmm. corrupt. It's not just we can all work with flaws yep. because we all recognize our own flaws. We don't expect pastors and leaders to be to perfect. Be perfect. You know? right. But what we expect is for them to be honest mm-hmm. and say, mm-hmm. I was wrong, and so now let's correct it and make it right, or, you know, this and that. You know, one of the reasons, man, why my father is one of my favorite preachers of all time is because my dad never hid his flaws. He would tell me, I did this wrong, I did that wrong, don't do this. 
And he would tell people this because he was worried about them doing what he had done. You know, but my father never built a mega church. But he imprinted, you know, these lessons on people's minds the way they understood where well, you can have a pastor or a man of God that can walk in integrity and things of this sort. But he ain't gonna have the biggest following. Mm-hmm. Because he's not gonna you know, he's not gonna make the compromises to get that following. And then so too much honesty for some folks, you know, they just can't handle that. They would rather make excuses to preachers that's not living nothing and that's doing damage to people's lives than actually follow people that's actually helping folks and telling the truth. And that was one of the things, man, is when I decided I wasn't going to be a part of the boys' club anymore and that I was going to stand for what was right, I became an enemy of the state, so to speak, the mm-hmm. preacher state, the church state, because I knew too much. So it's almost like, you know, you stand in the bull bravano, you can't start, start snitching. We got to, you know, we got to ruin your reputation to take you out because yep. you know too many things that we have done. So before anything come out, because they're afraid of what I might say, when I was just wanted to move on quietly and not be messed with. But because they try to do a preemptive strike, now it, it makes you have to be defensive. And then they cause things to come out about themselves by trying to come against you. You know, and right. so, you start, mm-hmm. so that's when these preachers start getting told on about all their babies, all their extra women, their extra men, and all these improprieties of money and things of this sort is because they're already corrupt. And corruption just leads to more corruption because they refuse to repent, they refuse to correct themselves, they refuse to do any of the things that's necessary to make it right because they've got to be put in this light of being perfect and without spot or blemish so that nobody can challenge them because if they're wrong, then that means they can be questioned. And one thing that these pastors hate is to be questioned. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, you know what? I'm going to say, and I know without a shadow of doubt that there's going to be people who listen to this, listen to these stories, and are going to doubt it. There are going to be people who listen to this story and say, well, you can't lump all churches together. It's not all churches. It ain't all pastors. There's going to be people that listen to this and say, not my church, not my pastor. But, you know, you got to look inside and yourself. Mm -hmm. And really be honest with yourself because you can lie to us, you can lie to everybody else, but you got to be honest at least with yourself that these situations are going on daily in people's lives. Just because you don't see it mm-hmm. in your church, maybe not yet, but you don't know what went on before you got there. You don't know what's going on, especially if you're not in leadership. If you're not in a leadership role and all you do is come on Sunday and sit and sing when the choir they sing, you know, when they tell you to sing, you know, you sing your little part and you give your money and listen to the pastor and shake hands and y'all go out to eat. If that's all you do, you ain't going to know what's going on. But you'd be one of the that's first true. people to quick to say, not my church, not my pastor, but these are, this church system. And this is not about, and I say it all the time, and I'm going to continue to say it, it's not about any one particular church. It's about the system. Mm-hmm. It's mystery Babylon. It's the system mm-hmm. that has people bondage, that's holding people captive. So no, mm-hmm. it's not about your church or your pastor or, or, or nobody's trying to lump all churches and all pastors together. Where did anybody say that all churches and all pastors do this? Nobody has said that on the show, but I guarantee you somebody's thinking it Somebody going to say it because we've all heard it. Yeah. And I challenge you. Go ahead. And, and I, not, I challenge you to ask, look deeper and ask yourself, if this happened to him, why can't it happen to me? I never thought I would be. You always read stories about cancer. So I never thought I would get cancer, but I got it. Out of everybody in my family, I got cancer. Never thought it would happen to me. You know, praise God, I, I survived it, but I got it. Never thought it. So you don't think that things could happen to you. You don't think things could happen to your loved ones, to your friends. But you know, these things happen. Spiritual abuse happens. You know, you got one spouse leaving the church and other, and you know they're fighting. 
these people probably you got couples who rarely argue, but now one decides to leave the church. Now they fighting every day. These things happen. Whether you choose to accept it or not, they are happening. And your job is to pray when you see it happening to help people get through it if you know it. You know, so I'm gonna jump off my soapbox. Well, you know, like you said about people do not want to get involved. The, the especially now the black church, and it's not just happening in black churches; it's happening in all, in all churches. But in the black church in particular, it seems to be a lot more prevalent because of these traditions and things that we're still enslaved to that come out of the way the leadership style in the black church developed in a lot of cases, you know, because of our culture, you know, where we try to treat grown people like children. And as children, a lot of us are old enough to remember children are, are seen and not heard and don't talk to grown folks unless you get to talk to. And pastors think that they're raising members. You know, that's what they call them. You know, you hear them say things like, you know, oh, my child and, and this, that, and call everybody my son and daughter. So they go going to these ministries with this mentality that, you know, they're raising children, adult children. And so you, you minimize the person's importance and impact and all these other things. There's so much psychology underlying the way that things happen in our churches as to why they seem to be so susceptible to this type of corruption. And, I mean, once you've been through those types of experiences, for me as a single man now, you know, I'm a lot more cautious when it comes to meeting a, a woman. I would like to be married. I would like to be with someone. But the pigeons are much more slim now in the black community because a lot, most of the women go to church, and they're very loyal to, you know, their leadership. And when I mm. see that, I just immediately back off. I mean, two things that make me stay away from a black woman. If she's too faithful to her pastor or love Barack Obama too much, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel you on that, bro. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't do it because you're always talking about another man, you know, based on whatever this is flawed or, or criteria in her mind that she has to judge, you know, the greatness. And the person that's trying to do the most for them, to take care of them and love them and all these other things, you know, they act like, you know, you, Clark Kent, and all these other people are supermen. And so I, I say, you know, the infatuation with leadership, you know, is just is overwhelming and it's way too much. And because I see in most of my experiences the women get more easily manipulated than the men, you know, I, I just – I tend to just stay away. As soon as I know that you know, she starts talking about her pastor, every time I meet, if I meet a woman, and she starts talking about all the stuff she does at church and how she serves the pastor, I'm out. I'm like a gingerbread man. I run, run as fast as I can. You won't catch me. I'm gone. Because that's always a red flag to me. Then that lets me know that her mind is not really focused on the Lord because she can't see the Lord unless she looks through the, look at the Lord through the pastor. And that's a flaw, man, because that lets you know right there that's an abusive church that doesn't teach its members how to be dependent on God and independent of the leadership. Mm-hmm. And so yep. if they can't cut that tether, then I just don't go that route. Mm. No, that's right. <laughs> John, what you got? Uh, let me read the scripture here real quick. Um Matthew 10, verses 34, says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against his mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Mm. That's what I got to say. Okay, okay. Let's go ahead and land this ship. Uh, Any closing final thoughts? Final thoughts, fellas. Uh, Rob, final thoughts. 
Man, this has been a, a a wild show, man. I mean, the, the stories have been uh, just just unbelievable, man. And I would just say that you really just have to remove all of these these people uh, out of your your relationship with Christ. I mean, there, there's nobody that separates that, that you know you from from God. There's nobody that's the mediator but Jesus Christ. And that's where your relationship should be. That's where your focus should be. Take all of these people, these idols, out of that that uh, your your line of sight to God. I mean, that's the bottom line. Just develop your relationship with Christ, man. We say stuff like this all the time, but it just bears repeating. It just bears repeating. Stop focusing on man and stop focusing on empty religion and focus on Jesus Christ. Kevin. Kevin, um, LL. Yeah. Um, as the scripture was read, um, I hope I don't sound insensitive when I say this or insensitive. Um, these separations are for your good. If you've come out of the church and a spouse or someone that holds a relationship with you, be it family or friend is still inside of the system. The best you can do is live your life through Christ. And let that be the guiding light that will get them out eventually. Um, don't beat yourself up about it. Mm-hmm. Don't uh, ponder and wonder if you're wrong, if, if this is all your fault, what's going on. It's not. You're supposed to come out of this system. No system has any control over you. Let Christ have his perfect will inside of you. Um, and I'll tap out on that. All right. Kevin, you back? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Final yes. thoughts? Uh, just, you know, um, uh, again, just um, I reiterate something you know, I said earlier. You know, don't don't uh, put yourself in a bubble, you know, where, um, you know, where you can't um, where you can't relate to the rest of the world and where you can only relate to church to, and you can only. Uh, you know, even your marriage, where your marriage is so tied to just church, you know, you you uh, get out in the world and and base your marriage on on Christ and base your marriage on, you know, a genuine relationship with one another, and you know, you know, leave the church out of it. I didn't say leave Christ out of it, but you know, the church should be, uh, you know, an extra. Uh, you know, something is it should not be a central um, pillar that your marriage rests on. Mm. That's good. That's good. Uh, I, I like to say that if if you are in a situation where your spouse is uh, still in the system and you've left, and and you know y'all still fighting, arguing, I, you know, try to be the bigger person. And I know that could be difficult where, you you know, you feel like they're running over you. That don't make you weak. It takes strength not to fight back when you know you can, When even especially when you know you're right. That takes strength. And you know that instead of that strength, you don't, always, you don't have to always win. Sometimes in order to win, you have to lose. So lose the argument, but win your spouse if you can. If your spouse is willing, and, and it's going to be very difficult at times, but you can do it. I mean, you know, it, and it takes two. It takes two. But realize that that just because God has opened your eyes, um, God may not have opened their eyes yet, and they might not be able to see it. You know, I think my wife's eyes are still closed. Um, and so, and it will take time. It will take time, but over time it will get better. You will get stronger uh, in your faith, stronger in your walk, um, more mature in Christ, going into the deeper things. But try to have compassion um, for your spouse that's still in, if you can, if you can. And it's just me generally speaking, and that's it. Hey, uh, hey, Rob, can you uh, pray us out? Did I get everybody? Yeah, I was, everybody I was, give a chance I was to get on, their final thoughts? I was on mute, man. Okay, yeah, yeah go ahead, Rob. You. Thank you, most gracious and heavenly Father, for this show, for this opportunity once again to come before your people, to bring them some encouragement. We pray, as always, that something was said that will help somebody 
to uh, get through this thing, this difficult thing that can divide with the church system getting in t- in between so many relationships, Lord. We just uh, look to you for your guidance as always. It's always about you, never about us. And we just thank you always, always, and worship your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Close us out. Amen. 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 Kev, we thank you, man, for following through and sharing your story, man. It's always interesting I listening you. to that story, I thank you man. All for, I thank you all for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, you know what? I did have another question for you. I, you know, I know we run short on time, but so oh, yeah, after yeah. while all this stuff is going on, uh, you know, after your her brothers first found out that she lied to you after they came to kill you, mm-hmm. how did they did uh-huh. they treat you <laughs> different, better? Uh, did they look at you any kind of? Especially when they seen all the stuff going on with the courts, how did they treat what? you after that? So, so, so uh, I didn't re- I didn't interact with them. Uh, really, after that, they I never talked to them after that. Uh, you know, because I guess you know sometimes you know when you know when when there's a split, you know one side of the family don't talk, the other don't talk no more. So yeah, I, okay. I never talked to them again. But but see, I talked to her her dad, right? Her dad lives in another state, and he told he is the one who told me. You know, uh, he said that. Back then, you know, uh, Sharon was saying all of this stuff. Sharon was saying this, and you know, um, she said, I, "She." So he's the one who told me that she said, "She said, yeah." She said, "You jumped on her," and and uh, so he's the one who told me that, you know, what his sons came over there to do to me. So I, mm. that's how I know for a fact what you know what was was going down. So I so I talked to him later on and. So I'm cool with him, but you know the brothers again. You know they kind of, they kind of, you know out there, out there in the streets. So I didn't really deal with okay. them too much after that. But um, but I could tell from the look on their faces that they realized they had been had. You mm, know. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh-oh. Yeah. All right. Just appreciate the story, man. So you had to go yes, through that. Yeah. learning lesson. And I'm you know, I, I, I was just you, thinking before you asked me that. You know that that's been twelve years now, and and it seemed like you know I remember like it was yesterday. You know all mm. the details, how everything, how I was feeling. You know it's deep, man. You know it's yeah. it, it affected it, it affected me more. Yeah, it affected me more than I realized. Because back at the, back then, I was just trying to you know, be strong and handle it and deal with it, you know, just to, trying to move on. But, you know, it, it really did affect me, you know. Mm. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, fell, everybody, we appreciate you taking this time out. We know you could have been in church, but you chose to kick it with your boys of Real Talk Radio. This show will be live on YouTube uh, either sometime later on tonight or sometime tomorrow. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, the username is Joel Belton, J-O-E-L-B-A-I-L-T-O-N. Uh, we thank you guys. We love you guys. Hitman, appreciate your call and your comments, and we will see you guys next week. Peace. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Real Talk Radio. Check out our website at www.4realtalkradio.com for updates on all of our social media platforms, including our YouTube channel, and Facebook page. Feel free to send us any of your comments, questions, or criticisms. If this show or any of our past shows have helped you in any way, please feel free to share it with your friends and family. See you next week.